So our topic today is about one of the most impressive collections in the museum, the Imperial Screen, uh, which is currently on display in our gallery. And we are very happy to have Dr. Richard Pack give us a talk focusing on the design motifs and the themes of the images of this Imperial Screen. So I will briefly introduce Dr. Pack to you. Uh, Dr. Pack is currently director and curator of Asian art for the McLean Collection, an Asian art museum and map library located north of Chicago, Illinois. Dr. Pack has a bachelor degree and a master degree in East Asian literature from the George Washington University and a PhD in East Asian uh, art history from Columbia University. He has written and lectured widely on the visual, literal, um, cartographic, and material, uh, martial arts traditions of East Asia. He is the author and co-author of, of um, many publications, uh, such as Passion for Form, Selections of Southeast Asian Art from the McLean Collection, the McLean Collection, Chinese Ritual Bronzes, uh, Cartographic Traditions in East Asian Maps, Highlights of Asian Art, the McLean Collection, Chinese Swords and Ancient Tradition and Modern Training, and um, the Chinese Jar, a novel published in 2015. So Dr. Pak has uh, kindly recorded his uh, talk today, but he's also joined us today and will take questions at the end of his talk. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Dr. Pak's presentation. My name is Richard Pegg, and I'm the director and curator of Asian art for the McLean Collection, a private Asian art museum and map library located on the north shore of Illinois. Today, I'll be talking about uh, a really fantastic object that's in the Lizadro Museum of Lapidary Art, uh, also lo located on the north shore of Chicago and introduce to you uh, some themes, talk about it, the object itself, um, and uh, some really interesting things associated with it. The, it's a screen from the late 18th century that uh, the Lazadro family was able to acquire in the 1950s and um, was uh, a fantastic opportunity for them to acquire this object. It is a uh, tenfold screen produced in China. You can see the dates uh, here. It's made of a number of materials, uh, the most significant being the wood uh, that has been lacquered on panels, uh, the front you see is primarily a red lacquer and the back is a black lacquer with various colors added. Um, it was recently restored uh, at the Chicago Conservation Center, a, a multi-year project, um, some of which hopefully you were able to see in another lecture associated with this screen as part of the uh, Lizadro Museum's reopening they um, had this object conserved as sort of a centerpiece, and so they've begun a series of lectures and research associated with it now that it's in its uh, restored format. Some of the questions that um, are associated with screens like this, why are they sometimes called Coromandel screens? That has to do with the system of um, the trade routes that were established starting in the 16th century uh, through the 19th century, the um, two, essentially two routes to go to East Asia, to China specifically, and to exchange goods from there. Uh, one was set up by the Portuguese, which went around Africa. The other was set up by the Spanish that went around South America or across Central uh, Central America and then on to uh, Manila. 
and one of the major ports of call was the Coromandel Coast on the western coast of India. Uh, this was one of the important coastal ports, uh, most specifically associated with the British um, East India Company. And so quite often these screens, which came through this trade route system, are cord Coromandel screens uh, when they arrive in Europe. And quite often these multi-panel wooden screens uh, would have these, uh, this name, uh, this, this kind of term used uh, in association with them. So the screens themselves as physical objects, uh, how are they used? They were used as they would be used today to divide space, to break up space, to break up a larger room. Uh, you can create smaller rooms or create backdrops um, against which you could uh, set up uh, a throne or tables or any number of uh, uh, types of installations inside. They functioned, uh, as you know, you have, as in the case here, two different kinds of designs on two different sides, and so you can create two different kinds of space um, uh, within a single space. And so you might have a design motif going on one side, that's uh, very different from the design motif that's happening on the other side. In this case, uh, some of the materials that are used, um, this is a particularly fancy um, and would have been extremely expensive to produce screen, uh, the lacquer itself. Uh, so the lacquer on the back, the black lacquer, uh, is only probably one or two coats with colored lacquers that are added on top of that. And uh, the front is actually has carved lacquer. So that red lacquer is in relief. It's actually quite deeply carved. And in order to produce something like that, uh, lacquer comes from the lac tree, uh, which is indigenous to East Asia. You have to uh, prepare the surface. The wood itself has to be dried and cured. Um, and uh, then you apply a, a layer of lacquer. It takes upwards of two to three months, depending on the time of year and the uh, humidity levels within the uh, space that it's drying and curing. Uh, and so something like the red side would maybe be 10 layers of lacquer. If you add up two to three months per, it just uh, it takes at least two years just to make the blank red lacquer uh, that is then carved, and there are various patterns that are used, um, and we can talk about that uh, in a moment. Uh, but more significantly for this particular style of screen, uh, it's inlaid, and it's inlaid with a various, all different kinds of colored stones. Uh, lapis, lapis lazuli, uh, uh, malachite, uh, azurite, um, uh, there's ivory, there's cornelian, there's various kinds of agates. Uh, there's a whole range of stones that are used to, for the artist to create a more painterly or realistic depiction of uh, the scenes uh, that are being created within that. So it's a very precise uh, methodology. In uh, English, we use the term pietra dura. Uh, this is from the Italian phrase, and we see that uh, in particular in places like uh, the Taj Mahal in Agra, this, this idea that stone, pieces of colored stone are inlaid, in the case of India, it's typically inlaid into marble, white marble as the background. But in this case, it's uh, inlaid into the lacquer itself and then glued in. And it's a very precise and time-consuming uh, process. And so not only would it be two years to make the blank red lacquer screen, but all of the inlay, all of the carving, all of that has to be laid out, carefully cut into, uh, the shapes have to be cut into uh, the lacquer and then inlaid. So we're talking about a very labor intense um, and very sort of high-end kind of uh, object that's uh, created. 
Uh, other kinds of questions associated with this that we'll answer as we proceed through this. Uh, what do we know about who made it and when it was made? Uh, those questions we'll answer shortly. And really the focus of what I'd like to talk about today are the design motifs. What are the design motifs? Are they thematic? Does each panel have a theme? Is there an overall theme? All of these things can be integrated into a single object. Uh, you have lots of opportunities for all kinds of presentations in an object of this scale. Uh, the screen itself is over six feet tall and the 10 panels, uh, the width is more than 10 feet in width. So you've got a very impressive object uh, and one that, as I've said, has been recently conserved and really gives you a sense of uh, some of the really original and fantastic beauty that this object had. So uh, when we look at, uh, in the context of East Asia, a screen or a hand scroll or a painting, um, we know that in traditional East Asia, text is written from right to left. And so the screen would be read from right to left. So the first panel of this set of uh, screens, and you can see uh, I've given you a little detail in the top right, would be the far right side. The panel we're interested in for this discussion is on the far left. And so this would be technically the last uh, panel of the screen. And again, so we have to keep in mind that we kind of read this right to left. And typically there's a kind of narrative order that's presented in that. Not necessarily in this case, but quite often there's a very specific uh, narrative order that's presented. But in the very last panel, uh, we see in the upper left side, and I've highlighted it there in blue on the left here, uh, and then blown up the details of the characters. It tells us that this was made, uh, dated to a spring day in the Xinhai year of the Qianlong reign. This would be the Qianlong emperor who was uh, the emperor of China from 1736 up until 1796, 60 years. Um, the second longest reign, his grandfather having um, reigned for slightly longer than that, uh, but it's considered, 60 years is considered a sort of perfect reign uh, within a Chinese uh, context, and there are very few emperors who actually got the opportunity to rule that long. So this is fairly late in the Qianlong Emperor's um, reign period, 1791, the Xinhai year. And then below that, there's an additional five characters that tell us the Zhou family of Runan, which is in today's Yangzhou, uh, Runan being a historical name uh, for the city of Yangzhou. And then it says, made this, uh, essentially, um, it's, a, it's a character that means something like uh, to inlay. And then there's two little seals uh, that are also in relief. All of these are inlaid in ivory um, that says Joe family of Runan and then seal of the humble maker. So this tells us quite a lot about, uh, certainly it gives us a very specific date as to when it was manufactured. The Qianlong Emperor is very famous for his very elaborate, um, the ateliers, the studios that he created for make, making these fantastic objects. Um, were, uh, he's famous for this. He also uh, amassed during his, his reign the largest collection of objects under a single emperor or king anywhere in the history of the world, several million objects. Uh, and so he was very uh, prolific as a patron of the arts. And this is really typical of the kinds of things that would be produced during his reign. The Zhou family itself are uh, historically, this is a family located uh, from Yang, Yangzhou itself. And um, they are known for creating this technique for inlaying specifically stones, hard stones and semi-hard stones, these, all of these colored stones that you see, um, into lacquer. They, uh, created and perfected this technique, and so the fact that they have been uh, asked to 
create it uh, goes again to the fact that the emperor is very much in, uh, interested in um, sponsoring the very best that the empire uh, available in the empire. And so we know when this was made and who made it, the very best of everything, all the best materials, etc., have all been used. Uh, the other material I didn't mention that's been inlaid are different kinds of woods. And so quite often the branches that you see, as you see in this example, are actually hardwoods that have been inlaid, uh, inlaid into uh, the lacquer as well as the stone. And so you have all of these different materials being used in, in this object. So specifically, I wanted to talk about the themes. So what are some of the themes that we find uh, in this object? If we start with the back of the screen, we see that there's three different sets of panels. We have uh, a small top panel that goes across the top here. We've got the large middle panel of landscapes. And then we have another series of small panels on the bottom. I want to talk about each one of these sections separately. Uh, and then uh, we'll, this will begin to give us an idea of the possibility of an overriding theme. Uh, and then we'll look at it more closely with the front of the screen. Uh, so you can travel from one panel to the next panel, and so you get a kind of pleasant motif of landscape, landscape to landscape. So I'd say there is no single overriding theme or any sort of hint as to what uh, the screen's theme might be. If we look at the series that are across the top, we see that there's 10 different flowers. And I've actually identified each of the flowers for you, given you the English equivalent, and then the Chinese, uh, the romanization, and then the Chinese characters themselves. Uh, this is a lot of information, and if you don't read Chinese, um, uh, it doesn't matter. Uh, what's important here is that <clears throat> Quite often in Chinese, you have a lot of homonyms. And so when you see uh, something like the magnolia or a peony or a lotus, uh, there's two different kinds of peonies, what we refer to as the herbaceous peony, uh, which is the one that grows um, as a fairly low flower. And then the woody peony, which is a shrub uh, and is uh, larger um, in its overall presentation. Um, all of these flowers have homonyms in Chinese for other words, like the lotus. Uh, you see the character he. It has two different names, lian and he. Uh, the he character is a, is a homonym for peace. Uh, the peony is uh, for um, prosperity. The the chrysanthemum, the, the Chinese rose, all of these, and, and I'll begin to tease out uh, in more detail some of these. But what's important to, to, to think about is that all of these flowers have other associations. It's not necessarily going to give us a clue as to an overriding theme, but quite often in Chinese art and architecture, what is uh, quite obviously a beautiful decorative motif also has other meanings and that's what we're going to look at. The kinds of rhymes and word plays, the homonyms that are embedded in the Chinese language and emerge when you begin to sort of uh, more closely examine uh, the themes that you see in an object like this which has a lot of, a lot of information that's being presented. It's really when we get to the small panels uh, across the bottom of the screen. There's 10 of those. Uh, and each one of these has a kind of still life presentation. So in this case, uh, we have this little vase with, um, if some of you may have noticed, the Nandina berry, uh, uh, which was on one of those small panels in the top. We have a Narcissus, we have a Lotus, we have a pair of writing brushes, we have three uh, little fruits, and we have a pair of coins here. These are the traditional Chinese coins. 
Uh, quite often they're round with a square in the center. In some cases they're oblong like this. Uh, but these are the brass or bronze coins that are created as uh, part of Chinese currency. So what are the hidden meanings uh, that are can be discovered within this scene? If we look at the left side and the word plays, we see a vase, uh, which in Chinese is ping and is a pun for ping an, peace. And typically that's within a family or within a marriage. If we continue down on the left side, we see the double coins. In this character, Shuang Qian uh, of double, we'll see again and again, this kind of uh, increases the e efficacy uh, of a particular motif that's presented. And then in the bottom left, I've pointed out a double brush, Shuang Bi. Here's that Shuang character again. And this is a rhyme, the rhyme with brush for the word Bi. Uh, which means surely or definitely. So again, this is sort of a guarantee that other things that are presented uh, are, are doubled up in their significance. So on the right side, we see at the top the Nandina berry. Uh, below that is a Narcissus, and below that is a Lotus flower. And this is uh, all these three together add up to an expression in Chinese that goes hua feng sanju, which is a wish for wealth, longevity, and uh, for many sons. So the three together in combination make a visual word play. In addition to that, below that, there are three dragon's eye fruits, the uh, san gui yuan, this is another four character and, and leads us to another four character expression, Lian Zhong San Yuan. May they achieve the three successive firsts. And this is about the examination system, that your sons would pass all three levels in traditional China in order to enter into the civil service system. You had to pass an exam, a local exam, a provincial exam, and the metropolitan exam. And only the top placed finishers in each exam advance to the next exam. So the top 10% in the local exam pass on to the provincial exam. The top 10% of the provincial exam pass on to the metropolitan exam. So all of the motifs that you see that build on the right side are for uh, prosperity, long life, together, the wish for many sons, and that all of those sons are successful in the uh, imperial exams. If we look at another panel, for example, this is the one on the back of the fifth panel, we see again our double brush, so we know that whatever wishes are being uh, provided are uh, uh, doubly emphasized uh, for certain that it should happen. We've got in this case an osmanthus flower in a teapot and again our lotus and the combination of the guihua and the lien uh, again uh, is a wish that you may have continuously successful uh, students uh, in the exam system uh, and sons. In this case, we have triple coins, which is three times the wealth, but the most important four character expression that's being provided is we see an official's cap, which is here with this little piece of coral that sticks up. Uh, this is the coral finial on an official scholar's hat, what's referred to as the Hong Ding, the red cap. Uh, official's cap. And then we see also in this container, this brush pot, not only the brushes and two scrolls and a fly whisk, but we see specifically a peacock feather. And so the official's cap here, those who achieve the highest rank of officialdom get a peacock feather that gets attached to it. And so the combination of these two is Hongding Hualing, which is a wish that not only do your sons achieve high rank, 
uh, but in, in addition, they um, received the highest rank, that they got the peacock feather placed on that. And so we, uh, again, the, this idea that um, this is going to be a wish, uh, all of the panels that go across here, they're very dense uh, like this. And I'd really like to spend more time on the front side of the screen, uh, but all of these panels can be dissected the rhymes, the four character expressions, the word plays, the homonyms, all of this uh, that make um, uh, viewing a screen like this so rich um, and time consuming. And I've only teased out uh, some of the options. There are lots of them. And I'm not a native Chinese speaker, so there are some nicknames and uh, word plays that uh, escape me. Uh, but you begin to see that um, this kind of uh, this uh, this interest in creating objects that have this kind of dense uh, wordplay uh, is very popular. Like crossword puzzles and other kinds of puzzles, uh, these are the kinds that were used in traditional China uh, and can be found on virtually any object with decorative schemes on them. So if we uh, look at the, the front of the screen, which is, uh, I would say, the more significant uh, of, uh, of the sides, the back side, as I said, is just straight lacquer. Uh, the front side has this very elaborate inlay uh, system. And so, uh, again, we keep in mind, we read from right to left. We've already looked at the inscription here that's given us a date and told us who's manufactured it. And what I'd like to do is go through each panel briefly and pick out one of the four character expressions that's being presented. Uh, in addition, each panel has its own four character expression, which gives a kind of uh, theme uh, quite often to the presentation within that panel. In some cases, as we'll see, it becomes embedded with the visual iconography that's presented. If we started with the back panels and we saw that there was a kind of wedding motif, uh, what struck me when I first saw this screen was the series of birds uh, across the front. And in almost every case, it's a pair of birds. In some cases, very specifically, a male and female, in some cases, it's a single bird, but a very specific bird that's depicted. But uh, this is also a kind of clue to us that there's a wedding theme going on here because you've got a male and a female depicted as the centerpiece in every one of these panels. So if we start with the uh, first panel, uh, we see uh, the four character expression that's presented here. Uh, translate to something like spring colors in Jiangnan. And <clears throat> if we think about that this is a wedding uh, uh, screen, the idea of springtime, the beginning of the relationship, the beginning of the wedding, often considered uh, and thought of as springtime, uh, this kind of theme uh, completely makes sense uh, within that context. If we look at the two, fl the two birds, the bulbul, in Chinese, the term uh, for this is bai to wong. And here again, you see the Chinese characters, which literally means white haired old person. And so if you combine these two together and use this term shuang, this double, shuang bai to wong, it's a wish that a couple stay together until their hair grows white. And so it's a very common four character expression. Uh, and so just the two birds by themselves and the name in Chinese uh, is a wish for a happy couple to be married for a long time together. If you combine the flower uh, here, the Chinese rose with the, the the name of the bird itself, we get the expression. So the Chinese rose is referred to as the Chang Chun, which means the long or the everlasting springtime flower. Uh, 
Combine the Chinese rose and the bulbul, you get uh, may a husband and wife enjoy a long life until, again, they're white-haired together. Uh, it's a beautiful sentiment and the joining of these two visually. If we look at the second panel, we have the expression, uh, the lotus pond, uh, sort of something like rustic pleasures. The lotus itself, uh, as we've seen, this lien, as in lienza, and the h also uh, is a rhyme for harmony. And so uh, this idea, and here's the character uh, itself for lotus, um, uh, for harmony within a family, within, between the couple itself, this is uh, a very common motif that you'll find throughout uh, Chinese decorative motifs. The mandarin ducks uh, that are pictured uh, uh, on this particular panel, uh, these are in Chinese uh, lore associated with uh, a, a, a married couple that stays together forever ducks, mandarin ducks in particular, uh, mate for life. And so that association is carried over into uh, a, a kind of wedding, a wish for a, a wedding theme. You'll also notice that the lotus, these are lotus seeds uh, that are scattered. Uh, you see them here in the bottom part uh, from this scene. Uh, the lotus seeds themselves are an association with lienzi. Again, the rhyme here, uh, and one of the word plays uh, that we see is, uh, may your happy marriage bring distinguished sons. So yuan yang, uh, the combination of uh, the male and female Mandarin ducks with the, the, the guizi, uh, this for another this other four character expression. Uh, so the combination visually of the lotus seeds with the mandarin ducks is that may you be happily married and have lots of sons. Uh, and the the series um, of the screen on the back that we looked at this and may you pass the exams all the way. This kind of uh, expression. Is associated with the three reeds that you see here uh, that are also depicted, and so this uh, three li, the three reeds, the lian ke, uh, are an association again. Um, so you've got this wish for um, a happy marriage, lots of sons, and uh, that they all may all be successful in the exam system, all embedded into a single visual word play, uh, playing with uh, the, the rebuses, the, the embedded words uh, and the homonyms. On the fifth panel, we see the, fun, the, the phoenix stands tall um, or stands on the tall hill. Uh, the phoenix ex himself associated, uh, again, we have a male and female. This uh, character, the two characters together, Feng Huang, uh, we have a, uh, a rock, a long life rock, a what's referred to in Chinese as shou shi. So here's this character for longevity again, embedded in this kind of um, uh, uh, visual object. And then the tree that's depicted here is the Wu Tong tree. Uh, this is the place, the favorite place that the phoenix likes to roost in, and so. Uh, we see the Tong character of the Wu Tong tree uh, in the expression Feng Huang Tong Shou. And so we have the Feng Huang, uh, the male and female phoenix, the Tong of Wu Tong, and the Shou of the Shou Shu stone all uh, combined together to make this four character expression. Uh, may a husband and wife have a long life together. The seventh panel, we have the four character expression Yi Lu, uh, Rong Hua, uh, but this Yi Lu is the word play that's um, done several times within this particular uh, text panel. Uh, 
Um, we have uh, the fish provided here, which you see right along the bottom here. There's three fish uh, in combination with the peony. Uh, this is the um, the uh, woody peony we were talking about, the fu gui hua. So fu gui, uh, the two characters, fu is riches and gui is honor. So if you combine the peony and the fish together, you get the four character expression fu gui yo yu, uh, which means may you have abundance of riches and honor. And again, we have the three reeds presented here. Uh, the e lu, uh, the egret is a bai lu, and so one egret, e lu, uh, is the e lu that we find here. This character here is actually the word for road, uh, but e lu is an expression means all together, all at once, um, something like that. And so uh, we have the expression e lu, one egret. Uh, fu gui, uh, which I've given you here, this four character expression, i lu fu gui, uh, is the same kind of wish that we see here for wealth and honor. Uh, and then you see the i lu and uh, the san lian, i lu lian ke, uh, the word for read actually is also lu, and so we have. Uh, Another word play on the lu in this case, we have egret, which is lu, and the reed, which is lu. Uh, but another word or another kind of common expression or common name uh, for the, the um, uh, reed is lien ke. And so again, this lien uh, is uh, the sons, the su success of sons, and so we have. Um, this e lu lian ke can also be an expression for the success of the three sons or, or through the three exams, the, su the success of all of your sons through the three exams. So again, this panel is filled with wishes for riches and honor and that uh, all of your sons be successful. If we look at the ninth panel, uh, we have the fu gui. Uh, as we know, fu gui is the, one of the names for the peony. And then yong chang, uh, the, the may your, your wealth and uh, nobility um, uh, be glorious and everlasting, something like that. Uh, so you have the fu gui yong chang. Uh, in this case, um, uh, once again, actually, uh, like we did in the previous panel, this four character expression is very specifically given visually to us. We've got the peony down here. We've got the ficus, the flowering ficus here, and we have the parakeet here. And so the fu gui of the fu gui hua and the ficus rong, which is a rhyme with yong, uh, and the name for a parakeet, the chang wei ying wu, the Chang of the Chang Wei, so Chang Wei simply means long tail, Ying Wu. Uh, and so all four characters are presented visually uh, in uh, this uh, second to last panel. The Fu Gui here, the Ficus, uh, and the Parakeet. All. So I think the answer to this question I've already provided, what is the theme of this screen? It's a wedding screen. It's a, a gift, a very fancy gift uh, from the emperor himself. So uh, who would be the kind of recipient for a gift like this? Probably a member of uh, a high ranking official, um, a member of the imperial court, someone who's located in Beijing. And no doubt um, someone like this has married into possibly into the imperial family uh, or is about to marry into the imperial family. And uh, that they, the wish would be that they continue to uh, prosper, that the family continues to prosper, that the couple grow old together, they have lots of successful sons, uh, uh, etc. 
So uh, this is a quite a fantastic object, um, imperially made, end of the 18th century, a gift for a very high-ranking official. Uh, it's a spectacular object. The fact that it's available for the general public to see uh, in the U.S. is a fantastic opportunity to see not only some of the best of the lapidary arts as the Lizardro Museum uh, is uh, a specialist and specializes in this kind of material. Uh, this is a great masterpiece and uh, one of the great centerpieces uh, of the, the collection itself. And um, you should all take the opportunity to go and see it um, and uh, now you'll be a little bit more informed. Hopefully you can remember at least a part of what I've, what I've tried to get at. Um, but understand that an object like this is full of all kinds of rhymes and uh, word plays uh, and would be sort of infinite entertainment for those who wanted to spend the time to learn more uh, from it. Thank you.